Thank you, and it's a real privilege to be here. And I also just want to say a big thank you to the organizers for the great food and snacks that we've had. As a person who can't eat wheat and doesn't do well with sugar, um, this is the first conference I've ever attended where I wasn't being, where I basically had to starve because it was cookies and muffins for <laughs> lunch for the break. So I thank you. Um, I'm going to, my, my talk, this is actually a very uh, different talk from the sort of thing I've usually done. Usually I just give some ABCs of how I do things. This one's going to be a little different and it's a little bit difficult to put it together. But it's how I found myself coming into the back door of this whole mob stocking soil improvement thing. Um, I assume most of you are probably coming in the front door. You want to improve your farm, you want to do a better job with your livestock, you want to improve your soils. Um, I came in by force. I had some dire problems going on that I had to solve and had to solve quickly. Um, and I want to preface this by saying I, I went to Iowa State University in the 70s. Um, well, and then the bad news is that they never mentioned the P word. I was there for six years and I never heard the P word used in conjunction with animal nutrition. That's pasture. Um, and when I graduated, I actually was thinking of high-rise sheep. You know, how can we put the most sheep into a building or make the most use out of a building? I moved up to Minnesota and started teaching a lamb and wool program there. And I tell you what, my students gave me the education. Because there are a lot of old-timer shepherds there that have learned how to make it work in that area. And it wasn't what I learned in a university. Um, and some of the things I'm doing today are the things that they were telling me back then. Um, but anyway, let's move on with the predators and, and parasites. Um, I began pasture lambing in 1991, and if you wonder what's significant about that time, I had a baby in 88, and I had another one in 1990, and I no longer had time to be piddling around with some sheep in a barn, okay? So something had to give and the sheep had to start taking care of themselves. So that's what 1991 represents. You know, you got two toddlers running around in diapers, you've, you've got some job, work to do. So um, I had been to New Zealand and I had been out west and I had seen a type of uh, lambing method that, that looked like it would work for me and it's called drift lambing. And that's where you start out with all the sheep in a mob and uh, every morning you open the gate and you let the pregnant ewes go through the gate and leave behind the ewes that just had their lambs. And the idea is if it takes 21 days for ewes to drop their lambs, and up in Minnesota lambing is usually an 18 to 21 day affair, it happens pretty fast in the north. Um, the idea is, is if we keep moving like this, um, will move from paddock to paddock to paddock so that at day 21 we have reached the last paddock on the farm. So we've spread the sheep all over the farm. And the idea was to set stock these ewes and lambs for, um, and I just realized, oh here it is, okay, my pointer. Um, we, the idea was to set stock then these ewes and lambs for 30 to 50 days after lambing. And the, and the reasoning for this um, is that this enhances the ewe and lamb bond. It gives the lamb an optimal start. Um, the lambs tend to identify with a particular spot and their mother goes out to graze and comes back. Um, there was the least amount of mismothering this way. Um, you know, this was all good for the lamb. That's why we did it that way. And then around six weeks of age, and by the way, these photos span from late 80s all the way up to today. So you're going to see lots of differences and you're going to see uh, changes in the animals. This is a very old slide. Um, but at around six weeks of age, uh, we would combine all the different paddocks of ewes and lambs and uh, into one group and then we'd begin rotational grazing. So keep in mind, if we're lambing in May, this is part way through the summer before we actually start rotational grazing. And the object at the time was to keep this grass nice and vegetative. Um, I'm just got to check here. Okay, it was to keep the grass nice and vegetative, to keep that nutrition up high. Um, and by the way, part of what I was doing, I was dabbling with this Barula gene, which gives you just lots of triplets and sometimes quads. 
um, and talk about old slides. This is a really old one, and look at the body condition of these ewes, and, and you'll notice the change over time, okay? Um, but anyway, those are genetics that were not fit for this pasture situation is what I'm getting at. Um, but we were working at having this optimum high quality nutrition. And then, um, oh, probably a dozen years ago, I started finishing lambs on turnips. And this is actually turnips and rape. Um, it was an accident. The seed company sent, the seeds look very much alike and they sent me both and we put it out there and then I was wondering what this yellow flower was. Um, but the interesting thing is, is the lambs gained a lot better and this isn't really part of my talk but this year I planted four species and my goal is to probably plant 10 species in the future or more, who, know, who knows what the limit is gonna be. But this cover crop idea has me excited. Um, but that's been what we've been doing for about a dozen years is finishing them on turnips. Um, but we ran into a couple of snags, and these weren't problems in the early 90s. It was towards the late 90s. In other words, everything was going along pretty fine until the late 90s, and then two things started happening. One is I was running into more and more parasite problems, doing the same thing I always did, but the parasite problems were getting worse and worse. And you know, it turns out these things are cranking out a generation every three weeks. So anybody who's into genetics and selection, I mean, Holy cow, talk about something that can really change itself in a short period of time, but these parasites can adapt to what you do. And um, anyway, so basically we were running into some uh, worm resistance. Um, the, the big problem is this Hemonchus contortus, also known by a couple other things, but it's the size of a piece of hair about one inch long. You're not likely to see it with your naked eye. You need a microscope. Um, the thing that I was finding is that, you know, first I thought, well, we'll just let the, you know, get rid of the ones that seem to have a problem, and that will solve everything, and I'm not poo-pooing genetic resistance. I'm not. It's appropriate in some situations. But what I noticed right away is my highest producing sheep were the ones that were the most susceptible because they were under the most stress because of the level of production. So that did give me pause. Um, I participated in a uh, test that, um, where we, we tested for anthelmintic resistance and uh, I found out I had 35% resistance to valbazin and that's a wormer we have to use a lot of in it because we have liver flukes where we live and that's just a whole separate problem. But, um, and then a few years later I was starting to run into ivermectin resistance as well. I've got cydectin I think up there because I haven't had a ivermectin bottle for a while. But um, anyway, I was running into this resistance and, if, and I was working with other producers. I taught lamb and wool production for 14 years and everybody was running into this at the same time. So this wasn't just something on my farm, this is something everybody's running into. The writing folks is on the wall the drench gun can no longer be used as a routine management tool. We cannot keep using drench. That can only be your bailout in an emergency when something goes wrong, but you gotta go back to managing these parasites. And I'll tell you how I went about it. It's not the only way, it's just the way I dealt with it. Meanwhile, in 1991, I heard my first wolf howl. I was setting up some fence in the evening and I heard that perfect classic howl. And then I heard it answered by so many squabbling puppies, I couldn't tell you how many there were. It was just a racket. And then all of a sudden they're quiet, which means mama just came back and fed them all. That was in 91. We experienced a couple of sporadic losses and then in 1999, my dogs were starting, I had these sheep, keep in mind at this time, spread out in all these different paddocks, set stock for 30 to 50 days, right? So they're actually up to two miles apart in different little pastures all around the neighborhood. And in 1999, my dog, I had four dogs and they were good dogs, I thought. And um, some of them were joining other dogs and weren't staying where they belonged. Um, and then I also, you know, it's hard to count animals when you have more than 50 or so. And I had a paddock that should have had 80 no newborn lambs and should have still been lambing. I was expecting about 120 newborns in just that paddock. And 
it seemed when I went out there that the numbers were shrinking, and I had a llama in that group, and when I brought a guard dog out to put with the llama, she stuck her nose in the air and jumped right back in the truck. Something really was scaring her, and I had no clue what was going, absolutely no clue. It so happens to be a little later um, after these losses happened, but before I actually knew how bad, because until weaning, until we actually run these sheep through a chute, I didn't know how many were missing. And I was to find out, by the way, that we lost 40 lambs, I believe in, the, in 10 days' time out of that one paddock, and we lost another 35 lambs out of the other combined paddocks. Um, and the interesting thing is that some dogs had zero losses and other dogs had up to 12%. The llama lost 50% of his lambs. Um, so it was very interesting to see that these wolves had access to all these different paddocks, but the losses were quite different depending upon which paddock we were in. But I sat down at a wolf meeting that was, uh, Minnesota had a process going on where they took all the people who were called stakeholders in the wolf and we were trying to develop legislation. I sat down next to a, a prominent wolf biologist in Minnesota and I told him what was going on and his exact words were, we were expecting that. And I chewed on that for a really long time and finally found out he had a book coming out and in that book, I found out that what we had was a pack of 23 wolves. Well, back at that time, um, that, that's history on that, but back at that time, um, and this is a wolf we could have seen from our front window if there weren't as many trees as we have, but that, a game camera caught that picture, and he's way bigger than any of the dogs we have. Um, anyway, I... Um, I was in an emergency situation. I had used lambing, and um, you know we just lost uh, 75 lambs probably in about 10 days time, and uh, I had to, to put a cork in it. You know I had to do something to stop it, and I didn't have a barn or facilities to use, um, so I really had to solve this out in pasture, and I had a hobby of um, whenever I get to um, travel, I tend to go visit the shepherds that are up in the mountains out in the Rockies um, and just talk with them a little bit about their sheep management just because it's always fascinated me a little bit. Um, and also I've, I've read quite a bit and talked to some people who are familiar with um, shepherding in Poland. This picture is from Poland. And this method of sheep grazing has been used for 6,000 years, which is uh, a shepherd or actually usually shepherds go out with a, a actually a big bunch of dogs, often 10 or 12 dogs, um, and a flock of sheep, and they go to a new place every day. And um, in my travels out in the Rockies, this is in the Flat Tops Wilderness area, there's 3,000 sheep in that picture, and this guy was very generous with his time, and we chatted with him, and what I've learned is that their job as a shepherd, and where I'm going with this is that these guys obviously have had to solve these problems, um, Poland's a very interesting study because Poland's been through a lot of very hard times. They haven't necessarily had a lot of cash there to go be buying warmer. Um, and they've solved these predator and these worm problems thousands of years ago, quite frankly, um, by managing them. And so what I found out is that this shepherd's job is to keep the flock together. That's what his job is. The dogs protect it and his job is to keep that flock together and to keep it moving to fresh grass. Now our first thought is that fresh grass, the purpose of it is just to feed the sheep, but they make a point of never coming back to the, to the same place. Um, for example, he may have started, now let's see if I can do this, um, on the middle screen here, he may have started on the desert way out here in the background and walked the sheep up and up and up and up and over and down the other side never going back over the same ground twice, okay? They always went to fresh grass. And knowing what I know about parasites, I realized that, you know, what they're doing is not just providing fresh grass to this big band of sheep, but they're also not going back over ground that's heavily contaminated with parasites. And the shepherd's keeping that flock tight together so that the dogs can do their job. I realized then what my problem was is that my sheep were all spread out and scattered. 
Um, if you see the fields with the white dots in them, those are the pastures that we're using. Um, the white dots are not sheep. Those are where bales of hay sat, and we'll get into that a, a little bit. Um, but you can see where the fields were. And I, these aren't the only pastures. I mean, I had pastures up to two miles down the road. Um, so my dogs were far apart. The sheep were far apart and scattered. And basically what I had was a wolf smorgasbord, you know, a buffet, so they could go along and find wherever the dog, or even distract the, the one dog that's there while somebody else goes in and grabs a lamb. So I realized that I need to mimic what they, the shepherds have done for 6,000, 10,000 years. This is the rented land, and in this case, center screen here again, um, we start, started grazing here and, and we're just making our way across. This is very rough ground, it's very deceiving. You can't walk two steps without stepping up or off of a rock. Um, the rock is covered about six inches of soil, so it's very, when the grass gets tall, it's very deceptive, you can't see them. So, I'm in the middle of this big wolf depredation and what I did is I put all the sheep into a pretty concentrated bunch, put all the dogs, at the time I only had four, I put all the dogs in there with them. And um, I've got a few slides here because I was getting a lot of questions before this session, so I threw a few extra slides on the depredation thing because that apparently is a big issue for many people. But what I found was that multiple dogs, it, the number of dogs you need has nothing to do with the number of sheep you have. It has to do with the number of predators you have. And I know some of these farms with coyote problems, some people say, well, I just have coyote problems. Well, just coyote problems can be way worse than my wolf problems because I've had people who, who got a trapper in and pulled 18 coyotes in two weeks' time out of one pasture. And that's in the heart, the, the Corn Belt region, okay? Not out in the wilds of Minnesota. So these coyote problems can be pretty bad too. So it's the number of predators you're dealing with, not the number of sheep you have. Um, a few hints or suggestions, consolidate the sheep so that the dogs can be more effective. That's what shepherds have done for thousands of years. Consolidate them into a small group. Use multiple guard dogs, and here's a key. They need to be different ages and different sexes, and you need to have intact male and female dogs, at least one pair of intact male and female in there. And if the prospect of puppies is something you don't desire, um, you can at least vasectomize the male, okay? Um, trust me, that female isn't likely to get bred by anybody else with six or eight other guard dogs around her, okay? But if you want to, I've talked to vets, they can tie tubes on females too. I found electrified netting to be far more effective as a deterrent than strand fencing. I used to be using strand fencing at the time those wolves hit me, and I've witnessed wolves and coyotes just diving right through those wires. Um, or right over the wires, because strand fences usually aren't very high. The electrified netting um, has been far more effective as a deterrent, and um, you can get pretty fast at putting this up, and I've even seen a little trailer idea that rolls or spews out netting. Um, so there are ways of making this faster. Um, I used to not believe this. The wolf guys were telling me this for years, and I finally realized they're right. Remove all food. Carcasses have to be picked up. Um, the reason is it's not that they learned to eat lamb because they ate a dead lamb. That's not the reason. The reason is, is the more food you provide around your farm for wolves or coyotes, the more time they spend on your farm, the more time they study your livestock, the more time they have to figure out how to get around your defenses and eat your animals. Okay, so remove the food so that when they pass through, and that wolf I showed you a picture of, he literally passed through in a hurry. We had quite a few cameras out. He, he was like, let's get out of here. There's too many dogs and nothing to eat. Um, and he never came back. Um, and then also, just to note, there are some electronic devices and things out there that will help deter a hot situation, but they're not permanent solutions. So we've combined these sheep together, and we start, as soon as you've got all these sheep in a small area, and I had uh, 165 ewes in a half acre paddock, next thing you gotta do is keep moving them. And I found out that actually just simply moving the stock was a deterrent to predators, because they do have to study that 
group of animals and where to get in through the fence and where to get out and what's their escape route and all of that. So if you just keep them moving, you're kind of keeping them a little bit off balance. So I then had to come up with a way how to deal with lambing because I actually was still dropping lambs at this time. And much to my amazement was that um, I was expecting a massive mismothering and I was sitting there saying, well, if I'm losing four lambs a day to wolves, how many will I lose to mismothering? I decided my chances were a little better on the mismothering end, so I decided to go ahead and, and throw these sheep together. But I actually didn't have that much trouble. I thought it was going to be a disaster. And it turned out, you know what, these sheep were able to handle it okay. And then I came up with the next year, those wolves, by the way, were present for the entire year up until the next lambing. And they did disappear from Parvo, incidentally, um, but not fast enough for me to be comfortable to go back to my old habits. So I started this lambing on the fly and I've never gone back. It, it's been working fine. Uh, in the center screen again, oops, we've got this paddock. The first paddock you see here are three day old and older lambs. The middle paddock are lambs that were just born to maybe two days old. And then the third paddock way off in the background here are the pregnant ewes, okay? And what I do is every day, first I go through the, the drop bunch and I, I'm keeping records so I go ahead and tag these lambs and take care, if there's any problems, I take care of them. And uh, as soon as I'm done going through that drop bunch, I come back here and I open up the fence and I just let these older lambs drift into the younger lambs and we don't want to move the younger lambs, we want to move the older lambs because they kind of are more knowledgeable about who their mother is and how to find them, okay? We don't want to disturb the little ones. And we just let them drift in there and then we take this fence down and we set it up ahead of the pregnant ewes and we open that up and let the pregnant ewes drift through and all the ewes that have lambed, generally ewes that have lambed within three days aren't going to drift through that fence. They're going to stay behind. And you know what? I can tell you if you do this a little bit and you've got some idiots that go through it, just call them and you won't have any idiots that go through it. Um, and I really haven't had to call that many ewes. I mean, I just mark that down. If a ewe goes through the fence without her lamb, she, she gets marked down and she gets called. Quickly find out, everybody knows this, you can't move ewes with baby lambs very far, all right? Um, maybe around six weeks old, you can probably take them just about anywhere. And I would encourage people, you know, sheep are incredibly mobile, easy to move down the road. Th these are on a seven mile trek to a different pasture, okay? It's, it's not that hard to move sheep. Um, but the thing that I found out was that uh, we can't move these little lambs very far, so we have to munch our way from paddock to paddock, okay? We can't just take a big hike when they're little. So um, the first thing I found out when I bunched these sheep up and started doing more frequent moves is that we had, when we got around to our starting point, we had much taller grass. And I had been trained how we had to keep this grass, you know, under four inches for optimum nutrition and um, so on. So this was a pretty new experience. And so the rest of this is about what came out of that experience. Um, next thing I noticed was my sheep had cleaner backsides. The parasite issues were hardly a problem. And it took me a long time to put down that drench gun. You know, I was so used to drenching every month during the summer. And uh, I tell you what, I, you know, as I'm getting older, drenching lamb, ewes and lambs at, at, uh, on a 90 degree day in July was not really go working for me. You know what I mean? And I thought, I just need to hire a young guy to come in and pull those heads up, if everybody knows what I mean, uh, pull those heads up for me because I already knew that it takes a while for people to learn how to get the drench into the sheep, okay? So if you could just pull those heads up for me, then it would save my back, okay? Well, so I got an enthusiastic 30-year-old there on a good 90-degree July day, and I thought I was going to have to run him to the hospital. Um, you know, we're used to doing this work, but a guy who's been working in air conditioning all the time is not conditioned to doing it. And so I, you know, I realized that's not the solution either. So imagine my delight as I noticed that 
you know what? There really aren't any signs of parasites here. And I started running some fecals, and it took me three years before I actually would stop that habit because I was so certain they were just going to keel over. Um, well, here's a couple of reasons why that might have been working. Uh, one is, is that the larvae actually only exist in those first couple of inches of forage. They, stay, they have to migrate up and down in, in the wet portion of the forage, in the dew, and they only go about two inches high. So when we're grazing tall like that, we're way above that larvae zone. And um, there's another thing that might be working for us. The life cycle of Haemonchus contortus during hot July weather, it, it's very affected by the temperature, but during a hot July day is about a three week cycle. It takes about three weeks from the time that manure hit the ground to the time that that female is laying eggs in a sheep. Okay? Here's what happens. The poop hit the ground here on day zero. And at uh, 10 days they start hatching. At 21 days we're pretty close to the peak of the larvae hatch. And then if the sheep have left the pasture and don't come back, they slowly start to die off um, so that at about 60 days you have a pretty good kill. All right? And that's assuming the weather's warm to encourage a maximum hatch. Here's the difference between what if the red is what if you keep coming back every three or four weeks, which is what I was taught throughout the 90s, all the pasture walks I went on, is you got to be back in here and keep this stuff vegetative, okay? That's what I was told. Um, so this is what we're doing. We're, we're bringing the sheep in here with some overwintered larvae in the paddock and in her gut, and we're increasing slightly here, and then she's picking up a new level. When, when she comes back, she's picking up a much bigger burden. This is in the middle of June here somewhere, and then um, she comes back three or four weeks later and picks up a, a much bigger burden in late June, early July, and then by July 15th, they're dropping dead. Okay, that's what happens when we come back every three or four weeks. Now, the green here is what happens if we come back every six weeks. Okay, um, and this is the larvae la level just in the paddock. Um, you know, she'll, she'll pick up some, and her, the level in the larvae in the paddock keep increasing, but if we stay out for six weeks, it also keeps dropping. It keeps dying off. And so we avoid a really heavy larvae load in, in the sheep there. So is the benefit coming from the long rest periods, or is it coming from the taller grass? Probably a little bit of both. But what I can tell you is it's working. Um, I will have to drench this year, um, but it's because we're having a liver fluke problem. That's a deer liver fluke. It's spread by the deer. I'm going to have to t drench for that reason. Um, but that one only, it takes, that's a 60 day cycle, so it's, it's not going to take nearly as much drenching. Um, but it'll be the first time I've picked up a drench gun to drench my mob stocked group in eight years. Okay, so this has really been working for me. And just to be sure it's not just a fluke, that pun was not intended. Um, <laughs> I have always had a small group of sheep at home that I grazed more in the more traditional style, and I've lost up to a third of the lambs just keeling over dead in July. So I know there's a big difference in the parasite load just because of the type of management the sheep are getting. All right, so we, uh, we put the sheep into a mob, threw all, all the dogs into the mob, we solved the wolf problem, and I have not had uh, the only time a predator gets a lamb on my farm now is if I, I make a goof. Um, like if a sheep gets left behind somehow in a paddock and I don't get it for three days, out of that, if I don't get it out of that paddock, we figured it lasts about three days without a dog. Okay, so that's how prevalent the predator pressure is. So that, those are the only times that we really lose anything is if we, we have sheep without a dog for some reason. Um, and then... The taller grazing gave me, solved my predator problem, or parasite problems for me. But there's a saying on my farm my kids started 
um, whenever I needed them to help me. And uh, it was to move something heavy. And they'd come out and they'd move the heavy object. And then it's like, but wait, I have something else over here. Could you help me with that? And then this project over here. And so they started this, but wait, there's more, you know, kind of like the advertising. Um, so there is more here. And how much time do I have, if anybody can tell me? About 15 minutes. 15 minutes, good. All right. Um, I started noticing some things. And um, in 2006, we had what was said to be a 100-year drought, that it was the driest we'd been in 100 years. And um, we had no rain, basically, for three months. And then in September, we had this really nice four-inch rainfall. And what totally blew me away is uh, one of the pastures that I lease, um, and I've leased it for 25 years, is, um, is a, a nice piece of ground. It's kind of like a clay sand mix, and there's a fence down the middle, and I graze one half of it, and my neighbor grazes the other half of it. So it's a really nice side-by-side -side, um, example. And after 10 days after that rainfall, I could not believe the grass that I had on my side, the left side of this, the, the picture on the left. It was 10 inches tall at least. And I, I almost swore that I should be able to hear it growing or, or actually put a yardstick out and watch it grow because it was growing so fast. On my neighbor's side, which was continuously grazed, that's what he had. It was not more than an inch tall. What I had done, in addition to the mob stocking, and, and I'm going to talk about bale grazing briefly, but when that grass got to that kind of, like, it's, it's going dormant, but it's not yet dormant stage, I actually pulled the sheep in and fed them hay, because I knew that was a very vulnerable time for the grass. And I fed them hay for three weeks' time. And then when it went totally dormant like this, I put them back out and I grazed up the paddocks. Then we got that 10 inches of rain and we were back in business. So this is what my side looked like, and this is what his side looked like. I've got some even more, this is a different year here, um, but just showing that paddock on my side. Here's a picture in June of this year, and he sold, by the way, we, we now recently had another drought that's, it's, uh, it was a three year long drought, and that's now over with, but uh, we had a very bad drought for three years, and about halfway through that drought, he sold his cattle because he didn't have enough feed. I never did feed hay during the three years of drought. I was able to graze from May until December of each year. And in Minnesota, most people start feeding hay in September, October. So, um, but anyway, his side is the left side with the nice, pretty orange flowers. And uh, my side's on the right, and I took a, um, forage measuring probe and I measured 2,100 pounds on his side of the fence and 4,100 pounds on my side and that's actually after I had grazed off 1,500 pounds earlier than in the spring. Why? Um, I think we've been learning why here. You know, it's, it's, it's roots, it's soil structure, it's water infiltration, it's stand vigor, it, it's a lot of reasons. Um, I was very curious then to go out and just pull a few soil samples. And uh, I was particularly amazed by that middle one, which really gets the mind in gear. But the left one is, is the neighbor's side that was continuously grazed. And you can see the very obvious hard pan in there. Um, in the middle screen here, you can see right in here and here. This piece you could actually use for modeling clay. It was such heavy, wet clay. And on the right-hand side, this is... Um, you can see that layer in here, but this side was a lot more porous. And by the way, I used the same scoop size. when I. It, this is a post hole shovel, and I've done four sides and pulled it out. And the difference is the soil structure allowed the two on the right to spread out a little bit, whereas the one on the left um, was such thick, heavy clay, it stuck together. Okay. Um, Anyway, the middle one is very interesting. Um, this is where a bale of hay sat, and you can tell because there's the twine, my, my husband's pet peeve. Um, I do a, a system of grazing. I think I got the picture here. It's bale grazing, and, and um, it was just mentioned here. Um, oops. 
You see the, the remnants of some bales out here. Uh, we start, a tra I don't own a tractor. Actually, my husband just informed me while I'm away, we might have just acquired a tractor, but I have not owned a tractor all these years, <laughs> okay? Not for the sheep, that's his toy. And um, when I buy my hay, I have it delivered and unloaded in the field, and we scatter these bales out. The instructions are at least 30 feet, preferably 50 feet apart. And wherever you see the grass looking a little thin, put the bale there, okay? Wherever the soil looks a little poor, put the bale there. So that's what this middle sample is. And I expected to see an inch of organic matter above the bale string, but there's three inches there. And I, I have no idea how long ago this, this bale sat there. I honestly have no way of knowing because I've been there for 25 years, okay? What blew me away was the changes in the soil structure, and the other thing was the number of earthworms in that middle sample. There were no earthworms in the left-hand sample. There were a few on the right, and there were lots of them in the, in the middle one. Is that? I have no idea how long that bale sat there, because I, I should change the twine color every year, and then maybe I could tell you, but I, I honestly don't know. Um, anyway, um, now let's get into some of the problems, because I've heard many people say, oh, this just isn't going to work because you're grazing such mature forage and, and you're just going to starve your sheep with malnutrition. Um, and that was indeed a challenge. My productivity just plummeted the first year I tried this. It just absolutely plummeted. So I had to look at, again, how are these other guys solving it? How are, how are these shepherds of old doing this? And what I realized is, is what they're doing is they're going up a mountain, and when they do that, they're, they're basically turning back the calendar a little bit so that they're constantly grazing early spring forages, which are much more palatable. I can't do that, okay? That, that's, I, I don't have any elevation in Minnesota, all right? So I looked at what do I have and, and uh, what do we know? And what we know is that only the new leaves on a plant, only the new leaves on the plant are, have enough digestible energy in them to support lactation and lamb growth. All the rest of that plant is actually unsuitable for lactating ewes and growing lambs. This is made even more challenging because in the past five years I've been grazing a piece of land that was vacant for 10 years. So I'm grazing a lot of wild and woody plants, which makes the problem even worse. So I actually had to really ponder this a lot and look at my animals and try to figure out what the solution was. Well, the first thing I looked at was my residual. This is what I was doing, okay? Um, 4,300 pounds on the left, 1,100 pounds on the right. I was making them eat a lot more than just the new leaves. That was asking too much. Okay, we need to back off on this a little bit. Uh, the other thing I figured out really quick because they just simply weren't bringing in three lambs is that my line of barulas do not belong in this system. Okay, these ewes raising triplets need to go into something more fitting for a dairy cow um, because actually that ewe raising triplets is putting out as much milk per pound of body weight as a Holstein putting out 90 pounds a day. Okay, so she's a dairy cow. Um, so she doesn't really belong in the same system that the other sheep are in. Um, and I just try to graze just the tips with those triplet bearing ewes. And then I leave the real work to the twins and the singles. Okay, and the, the hardworking guard dog. <laughs> um, before, I, and this shows you how rough this land is. <laughs> if you can imagine putting electrified netting on that. Um, but the before is the big picture. I used to graze it down tight thinking I'm wasting feed if I don't. And that was the hardest thing in the world for me to, to drop. And it wasn't until I went to Gabe's farm that I realized that I'm not wasting that stuff if I trample it. It's actually feeding the soil. And that really helped me change my habits. Um, so the top photo is what I'm doing now. Um, on, 
On tillable land, I actually increase the stocking density quite a bit more and move more often. Um, here's where the residual is just right, and there, there's more to it than just measuring forage. I'm looking at the fill, the, the room and fill on the sheep, and how content are they? Are they lining up at the gate, or are they actually kind of like, oh, is it time to move now? You know. Um, here's inadequate room and fill. See that hungry triangle? That center screen here, you see this uh, hollow area? There's two, reason, there's two possible reasons for that. She's either not had enough to eat, or she's not getting enough water. And just keep that other one in mind, because sometimes that's the real issue. Um, but in this case, if we look closer, can you see how they've bitten off the tips of all these stems? OK, remember, they're only like 30% or 50% uh, digestible dry matter. So those are not, that eating those stems is not going to make a lot of milk. OK, and we're going to hurt production. Um, so here's an example of reed canary grass. This would be fairly early spring. This is how much we're going to leave behind. It feels like a mat when you're walking on it. This is, by the way, the residual of that reed canary eight days after I left that paddock. And this is during a drought at a point in time when everybody else had pulled their livestock in and started feeding hay. And I've got this in just eight days. This is just a close up to show that there's an awful lot of material on the ground. That was the hardest thing for me to learn how to do. One of the other solutions, one solution was a residual. residual. Don't take too much. Um, Paul earlier mentioned taking a third and leaving two thirds. That's a pretty good rule. I've been like a third or, or four, up to 40% and then leave 60%. So you're gonna leave most of it behind. The other thing that started happening just all on its own is this bird's foot trefoil started volunteering all over this pasture. And the farmer who owns the land told me, well, yeah, we used to feed bird's foot trefoil hay to our cows. And so they had spread the seed and it sat there for more than 10 years and waited for somebody just to open up the canopy a little bit and let it grow. And so that is really taking over all over the farm. And the other interesting thing is, is I'm doing a six week rotation where I absolutely stay off a piece of ground for six weeks and that's to avoid the parasites, okay? Um, but that's exactly what bird's foot needs to make a seed pod, six weeks. So we're coming back at the perfect time to pick up these seeds and spread them. Uh, a number of other types of clovers are coming in um, all over the farm. Each field's a little different. This is a before of um, the land that had been vacant for a long time. It was predominantly goldenrod initially. And this is the same location after. The only difference is the zoom. So we got the before and the after on that. So you know, wolves forced me into that grazing as a mob. I don't think I would have ever accepted it without that pressure because I would have said it would not have provided enough nutrition. Um, and I would have had a hard time leaving behind all that trampled forage. Um, parasites forced me to rest those paddocks a good six weeks. Um, in between these two things, I've, I've eliminated summer drenching. I've stopped the depredation. I now have drought resilient pastures. In the last three years, I never had to feed hay until the snow covered the pastures. In fact, last year I had several weeks of good grass left when we got uh, 18 inches of snow in December and I couldn't go back and graze it. Um, it resulted in um, more grass. Uh, the measurements I've taken is I think I've got about three and a half times more grass than most of the neighbors do. I'm going to strive, uh, continue to move every one to three days, um, eat only the new leaves and tips, and leave behind the residual to cover. That's a big deal now. Um, and encourage the bird's foot trefoil and warm season grasses. And now I realize it's important to have this biomass. How much time can you give me? Keep going. Okay. There's another side to this. How many have seen this? None of you? Just one person has seen this? This is a really big problem we've got to address as an industry. This is a report commissioned, I think it's commissioned, but the, the IPCC is involved in this. They wanted 
this group called Environmental Working Group with a cool name called Clean Metrics to study the impact of food on greenhouse gases. And this was the first study that was done. And when it's called a study, we're talking about taking a computer model and cranking numbers through it. They're not out there actually measuring methane from cows or anything like that. And what they found was that grass-fed lamb and grass-fed beef were the two worst possible things that you could do as far as global warming goes. Okay, that these were the most disastrous things going on as far as your food supply. I contacted the authors and one of the things I found out was that the grass-fed lamb was not actually from any grass-fed lamb measurements. It was from feedlot beef and they just extrapolated information out of the feedlot beef to come up with a grass-fed lamb. And I have a few problems with that. Um, but anyway, just so you know, this is the kind of science going into this stuff. Um, but more importantly is, um, well, first of all, they're advising us that, uh, and I can't read this well from here, but uh, if you're a four-person family, if you skip a steak one day a week, it's like taking your car off the road for almost three months, okay? That's pretty impressive numbers, isn't it? That, that you could have that big an impact by not eating steak one day a week. Well, I dug into this report. There's a page called Methods and Methodology, and item number eight, I found out that they did not include sequestration of carbon in their model. They did not include it at all because the IPCC told them that everything is in a steady state or neutral. So tofu made from soybeans grown in Brazil is far less carbon impact than your steak grown next door, okay? This just didn't sound right to me. Christine Jones was brought up earlier today. Uh, she has some really awesome work going on. She's from Australia. And on the left-hand side is a pasture that's had mob stocking, rotational grazing going on. The right-hand side has been continuously stocked. And here's what she has to say about um, carbon in the pro soil profile. The deeper the carbon is sequestered, the better. That in the 20 to 30 incre uh, centimeter increment, you have doubled the amount of carbon sequestered. And more importantly, it, it, the deeper you go, the more secure. La label here, the, I'm not sure if I'm saying that, lab, label or label. Um, soil carbon means it, it's not going anywhere. It's um, gonna be steady there. When we get into the 30 to 40 increment, we have quadrupled the amount of carbon that's gonna stay there. And when we get into the 50, 40 to 50 centimeter increment, um, it's even greater. And um, that the deeper we can get this carbon to go into the soil, the more steady or stable it is, and the more valuable it is to removing carbon from the air. The Kyoto Protocol only relates to carbon in the first 30 centimeters. It's not even looking at anything deeper than that. Her work is very valuable. So being somebody who likes to crunch numbers, I sat down and assuming the environmental working group um, is the worst case scenario of greenhouse gases from a lamb, I figured out that, uh, you know, we can go through those numbers and everybody wants that slide later, I can bring it back, but um, that under their numbers that lamb would be producing about five uh, tons per acre of carbon equivalent, okay? And then I pulled some USDA numbers for what they considered the amount of carbon sequestered by a well-managed pasture, and that wasn't defined, but just well-managed pasture. And the interesting thing is, without me having to mush numbers around at all, it came out to be that uh, a well-managed pasture sequesters five tons of carbon a year. So in other words, in a well-managed situation, it's a wash. And that means this is irrelevant and we can put lamb right down at the bottom there as being, and beef, I would think the same, as being the most uh, carbon friendly or the, even maybe even a carbon negative in some situations. So we can look at this 
Tall grazing, mob stocking, a little differently. This is sequestering carbon, it's building soils, improving water infiltration, reducing nutrient runoff, reducing the need for soil amendments, reducing the need to feed hay, preventing parasites, keeping sheep safe from wolves, improving the bottom line, because I certainly feel it in my pocket, and producing a protein source that is high in omega-3 fatty acids, which we haven't even gotten into in this talk. Um, so these are a few lambs from this year, just to show you that we can grow a good quality lamb under this system. And that's it. <laughs>